Story number one, The Old Man Across the Street. This might look like a normal and innocent picture, but there's a dark tale hiding behind it. I was around six or seven years old when this story took place. My mother worked a pretty hectic job after my father left us. I was an only child and she couldn't afford to send me to school, which meant I mostly stayed at home all by myself. The only time I got to hang out or play with other kids was when my mom took me to the park. We lived in a large block of flats and it was only a short walk away from the park. A lot of other families lived in the block with us and they took their children there too. It was a pretty welcoming community, as far as I can remember. So, whenever my mother got home from work, we'd walk down the street to the park. She was usually really tired after working all day. I knew she worked hard, but being a kid, all I cared about was playing with the other kids. While at the park, she trusted the other families enough to watch me, along with the other kids, and she'd close her eyes for a moment. The one day, my mother got home from work, and she really didn't feel well. Being my normal self, I didn't really care. I was used to going down to the park, so that's what I wanted to do. My mother went to lie down for a moment and promised she'd take me to the park afterwards, but that wasn't soon enough for me. Once she'd fallen asleep, I decided to go to the park myself. I knew where she kept the keys, and I'd walked to the park almost every day for more than a year. It wasn't that difficult. Now that I'm all grown up, I can fully understand just how dangerous this actually was. Surprisingly, no one seemed that confused by the fact that I was walking down the road all by myself. I got a few strange looks, but no one really seemed concerned. I made it all the way to the park before someone finally stopped me. It was a lady I knew and had seen at the park before. She had two sons that I often played with on the big slide. I can't really remember how, but I managed to convince her that my mother knew I was there. She took it upon herself to watch me while I played since I did end up playing on the slide again with her sons. Now, as you can see it in the picture, the slide was really high. At some point, one of her sons fell from near the top of the slide. He wasn't badly hurt, but he couldn't stop crying, and his knee was bleeding. This took his mother's full attention away from me, and her other son was trying to comfort his brother rather than play with me. I decided to move to the climbing pyramid beside the slide, and I climbed to the top. I was by myself, and now that I think about it, I was kind of hidden from the bench where the mother and her sons were sitting. It was only after I got to the top of the pyramid that I saw the old man standing across the street. He was wearing a long black coat that covered his whole body, down to his ankles, despite the hot weather. He also wore a black, wide-brimmed hat and used a wooden cane to lean on. Now, remember, I'm only around six or seven years old when this happened. So, when I saw this old man, I didn't think much of it but he was watching me. Every time I looked over at him, he would be staring directly at me. I couldn't see his face because it was hidden under the hat. I remember his cane, though. It was smooth wood that shined slightly. I forgot about the old man and continued playing. Eventually, I got bored. I went to the mother who'd been watching me and let her know I'd be going home. At this point, the only thing on my mind was to get home and have a snack. The first thing I noticed was a soft clicking sound following behind me. I didn't think about it at first, it was just a clicking sound. After a while, when the clicking sound was constantly following right behind, I became curious of what it was. I looked behind me, and that was when I spotted the same old man walking a few feet behind me. The clicking sound was his cane slamming against the sidewalk as he walked after me. I only glanced at him for a second. I looked forward again. It was at this point that I started feeling scared. I'd never seen him before, and by this point my mother had already taught me everything I needed to know about strangers. I carried on walking, since I was only a few minutes away from my apartment block. The clicking sound got louder behind me. I glanced around again, and the old man was closer this time, and walking a little faster. I started to feel scared now, but I didn't know what to do. I looked over my shoulder one last time, and his hand was stretched out as he was reaching out for me. I screamed and ran for it. I ran all the way to my apartment block and crashed through the front door to my apartment. This, of course, woke my mother up. She was angry, that much is obvious, but I still explained everything to her. She ended up going outside by herself to look for the man, but she didn't find anything. She got a neighbor involved. I remember sitting on my bed after being sent to my room and listening to them discussing getting the police involved. 
I don't really know what came of it since I'm a bit too scared to ask my mother about it, but that day terrified me. We still went to the park after that, and although it looks run down in the picture, it's still there. I never really enjoyed it as much after that day. Story number two, A Close Encounter This picture tells a lot of stories, although you wouldn't know just by looking at it. There's not a lot going on, but if you look closely enough, you'll notice a few strange things. One thing you'll notice is some girls running away from something unseen. Another thing you'll notice is the car parked directly in front of the store on the corner. Now, on the day this picture was taken, I was inside the corner store. I hadn't been there before. I was just passing the area, and since it was such a hot day, I decided to go in and buy myself a drink. Now, the corner store is nothing special. It's small and has very little options. There was water, milkshakes, and some sodas. It didn't take me long to decide on what I was going to buy, but I ended up spending the next three hours in that store. I was at the very back of the store going through the fridges when I heard a car pull up in front of the store. I'm a mechanic, and the car's engine desperately needed a tuning, so it would have been impossible for me not to hear it. As I was reaching into the fridge for my soda, I heard the car door slam shut. What followed was a series of shouting and yelling. I ducked down. I couldn't tell what they were saying because it was in Spanish or something, but the anger in their voice was enough to freak me out. I hid behind one of the few metal shelves and peeked over. A man had stomped into the store and was yelling at the man behind the counter. I figured the man behind the counter was the store's owner, which is the case with most of the small stores in my area. Like I said, I didn't know what they were talking about, but both of them were yelling pretty loudly and they were really angry. I put the drink on the floor and tried to make my way to the exit. I didn't know what was going to happen. It seemed like the best idea would be to sneak out and let these guys have their argument. I didn't get anywhere near the exit when I heard a loud bang. Now, I've never heard a gunshot before outside of movies and that, but on that day it was hard to mistake the loud bang for anything else. There's a moment where you go into fight or flight mode, but my body seemed to be stuck in between the two. I froze. I was hidden behind a metal shelf and dropped to the floor. Everything that happened out of that was mostly a blur. There was a lot of screaming from outside the store, and the yelling from the man behind the counter got a little less angry and a lot more scared. The man who stomped into the store kept yelling. He was even angrier. I stayed crouched on the floor with my hands over my head and waited for it all to be over. I heard a second gunshot, and the man behind the counter had stopped yelling. In that moment, I imagined him lying dead on the floor. I started crying, which I'm sure anyone else would have done. The next sound I heard was the car door slamming shut and the engine revving to life. The car drove away, and then there was silence for what seemed like the longest time. I stayed on the floor. I was too scared to move or even breathe. It wasn't long until I heard sirens in the distance. Someone had called the police. After a while, I realized that I also could have called the police. I just froze. I won't bore you with what happened after the police got to the store. I will tell you that the man behind the counter wasn't shot. The man with the gun just fired two gunshots into the roof to scare the man. I have no idea why they had the argument since I got out of there as soon as I was able to and I didn't stick around to ask any questions. You can't imagine how terrifying it is to hear a gunshot go off and to think to yourself that someone right by you might be dead. I'd never felt more terrified in my life. Story number three. Lock the doors. This is a picture of the neighborhood I grew up in. My family was constantly moving from one state to the next due to my dad's job. We never really stayed in one place for very long, but when we came to this neighborhood we stayed for a little longer. It seemed like our days of moving around were over. I managed to make some friends at school, which is something I never really tried to do because we moved around so much. This picture was taken the weekend I had a few of my friends over. It was a nice day, so we were hanging out by the pool for most of the time. Around lunchtime, we played some video games. We didn't have a lot of food in the house, since my mom wasn't used to me bringing friends over. She went out for a while to get some food for us. Now, I was around 15 years old, so being home alone wasn't a rare occurrence, but it still felt pretty cool. We put some music on and cranked the speakers up. It got hot again, so we headed back out to the pool, leaving the doors wide open so we could hear the music playing inside. Now, the music was so loud that we could barely hear anything else. We were also screaming and yelling. There was so much going on at the time that I was a little confused at first when I saw someone walking around inside the house. 
I was at the far edge of the pool. The sliding door leading to the living room was wide open. I jumped into the pool, and as I was falling into the water, I spotted a man walking through my living room. As the water engulfed me, I froze for a moment. It wasn't my dad, since he was still at work. I didn't get a good look at him, but he was also a lot taller and skinnier than my father. I was a bit confused, but I knew that I saw someone. I kicked against the bottom of the pool and shot towards the surface. The moment my head popped out of the water, I looked towards my living room. Whoever I saw was now gone. I quickly swam to the edge of the pool and pulled myself out. My friends didn't understand what was going on, but I rushed into the house and turned the music off. I had a look around, but I couldn't find anyone. I went to the front door and realized that my mom hadn't locked it when she left. My friends were still outside by the pool. I could hear them splashing in the water and running around. Then I heard thuds coming from the stairs. I turned around just in time to see a face peeking at me from behind the corner of the base of the stairs. As I looked around, the face pulled back and disappeared behind the wall. I rushed forward. I thought that one of my friends was messing with me and waiting to jump out at me when I walked past. I raced towards them, but as I got to the base of the stairs, I came face to face with a man I'd never seen before. He was the man in the picture. He was twice as tall as I was and towered over me. The sneer on his face was so sinister that it sent chills up and down my spine. I glanced down at his hand and he was holding a chainsaw. I let out a yell and ran back towards my friends. They thought I was playing around at first, but then they saw the man as well. We all ran to the other side of the pool and started helping each other climb over the fence. We jumped into the neighbor's garden and began banging on their sliding door. They were obviously a bit confused to find a group of teenage boys in their swimming trunks, still wet and screaming for help. We were all so spooked that we barely managed to explain what was happening. Our neighbors called the police, and it was quite the scene that my mom came home to. The man was gone by the time the police searched the house. None of us were hurt, but we were freaked out to the point that none of my friends wanted to hang out at my house again after that. I don't think my mom has ever forgiven herself for not locking the door that day. Story number one, Dr. Death. I lived in London for the better part of my youth. I was born in Canada, but my family's business had us move to Europe when I was only nine years old. That was a long time ago. I was living in central London between 1980 and 1990. Like I said, it was a long time ago. My parents were never really home much. They both worked hard, so it was usually just me and my little brother. This story took place during the winter holidays in 1986. My brother and I were off from school, but my parents had to keep working. This meant that we were home alone for most of the day. My brother and I weren't like most siblings our age. We got along pretty well since we were born only one year apart and had quite a lot in common. We got into a lot of trouble over that holiday. We'd just reached our early teens and that meant we were getting adventurous. We often snuck out of the house and wandered around the streets alone. Now, if you know anything about central London, you know it's not exactly the best place for two young teenage boys to be wandering around all on their own. That's not the disturbing part of this story. The disturbing part comes in after my brother got hit by a car. We were fooling around near the road after leaving an internet cafe with a couple of drinks and some snacks. Neither of us was really paying attention, and he stumbled out into the road just as a large double-decker bus was turning the corner. You can imagine what happened next. He was okay, for the most part, but his leg was twisted in an unnatural way by the knee, so the driver called an ambulance to take us to the hospital. I was distraught, and my brother was in pain, but we were both more worried about what our parents were going to say. The ambulance rushed us to the nearest hospital. I was tasked with giving the nurses all of our details and helping them call my parents. Then, they made me sit in the waiting room while the doctors took care of my brother. When my mother arrived, her face was basically like a giant tomato. I was terrified. My father showed up not too long after her, and even though his face was a lot more reserved than my mother's, I could tell he was just as furious. We waited and eventually a doctor came out to greet us. He introduced himself as Dr. Harold Shipman. He was so charming and nice. My parents had a long chat with him about my brother, and he even agreed to take a look at me, since I seemed pretty shocked by the incident. I was alone in a room with him soon after that. I'll have to admit that I don't remember all of the details. 
a lot of it is a blur for me. All I can really remember is how worried I was that my parents were going to ground me when we got home. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this is because of the doctor. Harold Shipman seemed like such a nice man. He made me laugh and joked about how he used to get into trouble when he was my age. I'd never really related to an adult as much as I did in that moment. My brother had dislocated his knee and torn a few ligaments in his leg, so he had to stay in the hospital for a while. Thankfully, the severity of his injuries kept my parents from being too angry with us. I remember visiting him in the hospital a lot before he was released. I met Dr. Harold again in the hallways and the parking lot during a few of the visits. He was my brother's doctor, so he got to see him every day. We both really enjoyed his company. My parents' job had us move again not long after that. We left central London and moved further into the country. It was quiet, and my parents were sure that we wouldn't get hit by any double-decker buses. I'll flash forward to quite a few years later. It was in the year 2000. I was sitting in a lounge watching the news by myself. My brother was out doing his own things, and my parents were shopping. The news was nothing special, but something caught my eye as I got up and headed towards the kitchen for a refresh on my drink. A face and a set of charming eyes that seemed so familiar to me flashed onto the screen. I didn't think anything of it at first. I was halfway into the kitchen when it hit me. I practically ran back into the lounge and threw myself onto the couch. It was Dr. Harold Shipman. I recognized his face instantly, even though he looked a bit older. My heart rose into my throat where it lodged itself and made it difficult for me to breathe. My stomach lurched, threatening to throw all the food I'd eaten that day onto the floor. Dr. Harold Shipman's face disappeared and was replaced with countless photos of elderly women, all of which had been declared deceased. I read the words, although I didn't believe any of them. They were calling him Dr. Death. My legs felt weak and I collapsed onto the couch. More images of Dr. Harold Shipman flashed onto the screen and he was in handcuffs. The news said that he was suspected of killing over 200 of his patients. I was alone in a room with him. He was my brother's doctor. My family put all our trust into him, and it almost drove me crazy to see his face on the news with the title, Dr. Death. My brother got home soon after that, and I think I gave him the biggest and longest hug. I even cried. It was a while before I told him what was happening. When I did, he just sort of sat there. It was like he didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to think. I just remember being glad that my brother hadn't been one of his victims. Story number two, La Bestia. I've lived in Colombia most of my life, although I moved to Rio for a while when I was younger. I always knew I'd go back to Colombia. It's my home. It's the place where I was born, and it's the place where I lost my mother. Colombia is a wonderful place but there is a lot of darkness hidden beneath the beauty. I went out with the girls, as I usually did on Saturday night. I was single by choice, and I loved getting dressed up and teasing the sexiest boys at the clubs. Sometimes I'd even let them take me home. I would never go alone. If you're from Colombia, then you know why. I always made sure my friends were with me. There were about five of us, but on that night, only three of us went out. We were all dressed to the nines. I had my best jewelry on a bright red mini dress that hugged my body, and a pair of black thigh-high, high-heeled boots. I was dressed for success. Success for me that night was getting free drinks all night long, and hopefully going home with someone sexy. The dance club we decided to hit was one of those ones you'd see in the movies. The music could be heard and felt from down the street. Bright, colorful lights flashed constantly through the ever-opening and closing doors. There were no windows to see into the club, and the longest line stretched from the entrance all the way down the street. I don't want to brag, but we were feeling confident that night, so we skipped the line and went straight to the front. The bouncer took one look at us and let us in, much to the disapproval of the people waiting in line. The night went by slowly, as things tend to do when you're drunk and getting drunker. We danced, we flirted, and I only had to pay for about two drinks. It was turning into the best night. Things kind of went downhill after a while. We were sitting at a table, resting our sore legs after almost an hour straight of dancing, when one of my friends noticed there was a man staring at us. Now, don't get me wrong, we get men staring at us all the time, but this was different. It had nothing to do with the fact that none of us found him the least bit attractive. It was the way he was staring at us. His eyes were unblinking behind his thin glasses, and I swear I saw him lick his lips a few times. He looked like a hungry lion stalking his prey. It made us uncomfortable. 
We were used to dealing with weirdos, and we weren't about to let him ruin our night, so we tried our best to ignore him. Then, he moved closer. He left his table and moved to the one directly across from us. I could feel the hair all over my body standing on end every time I looked over and caught his glaze. I suggested we leave and go to a quieter club for the rest of the night. My friends must have been just as freaked out as me because it didn't take much convincing. I paid our tab and we left. As we walked down the road, I decided to glance over my shoulder. I'm not sure why I did it. Something was telling me to look behind me, and I did. Just as my eyes hit the door of the club we just left, I saw the man walking out. His eyes met mine, and I saw a smile stretch across his face before he started making his way towards us. I shot my head around. My blood turned cold and a shiver ran all over my body. I stepped to the side slightly. My initial thought was to scream as loud as I could and run for it. I was worried that he would chase after us. I grabbed my friend's arm and squeezed tightly until I got her attention. When she leaned close to me, I whispered into her ear. We slowed our pace for a moment. The street in front of us was dark and empty, and if we walked back we would have to walk straight towards the man. My eyes spotted a man walking towards the club on the other side of the street. I didn't give myself time to think about it. I grabbed my friend's arms and ran across the street towards the man. He was a bit baffled at first. Once we told him about the man following us, he became very protective. He escorted us to his car and stayed with us until we got a ride. I'm very thankful for that man because I still believe to this day that he saved our lives. A few years later in 1999, we heard about a man named Luis Garavito, or as most Colombians know him, La Pistia. He is considered to be one of the world's worst serial killers. It is believed that he had over 300 victims, even though he only confessed to 147. Why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you this because when I saw his face in the newspapers the day he was handed his sentence, there was no denying it. It was the same man that followed me and my friends out of the dance club that night. I could never mistake those hungry eyes hidden behind his thin glasses. That night scarred me so I would never have forgotten that face. The newspaper said that all of his victims were young boys, but that doesn't stop me from wondering if my friends and I might have been added to his long list of victims that night. The worst part about all this is, he was only sentenced to 30 years in prison, and he might be walking the streets again very soon. Story number three, The Ritual. I went to Indonesia on vacation somewhere in the early 2000s, I know it's not the best destination for a vacation, but I was broke and the flights were cheap. At that point in my life, any vacation was better than no vacation. I had just broken up with my boyfriend of four years. My method of coping involved locking myself in a dark room and crying over romantic movies while eating mountains of ice cream and cake. This method went directly against my older sister's methods. She convinced me that I needed a break and she even offered to come with me. I'll admit it was nice. We were in a whole new country and, for a moment, I even forgot about my ex. We mostly went on guided tours and ate at interesting restaurants. That was enough for me. My sister was always very adventurous. The one day we went on another tour, only this time my sister was our guide. She rented a car and we drove out to the rural areas. She said something about wanting to see the sugarcane fields. I have no idea why. She was obsessed with it at the time, and I had learned never to question her weird urges. We found a sugarcane field that satisfied her, and I had to take a couple of pictures. She posed, and I actually enjoyed it. I was out in the sun, and my sister always knew how to make me laugh. At some point, she disappeared into the field. I was hesitant to follow her, but I also didn't want to stay on the side of the road all by myself. I walked into the sugarcane field and called out for her. All I heard in response was a distant giggle. I followed the giggling as best I could until I caught up with her. Now, I didn't catch up with her as much as she stopped running away. When I found her, she was frozen stiff and staring at the ground with wide eyes and a gaping mouth. I followed her gaze. I won't go into detail about what we saw, because it still makes me sick just thinking about it. There was a head sticking out of the ground. Not just a head, but the shoulders and torso were also sticking out of the ground. Someone had been buried waist deep in the ground in the middle of the sugarcane field. I was sick to my core and could barely move. Eventually, I managed to grab my sister's arm, and I began pulling her away from the body. I glanced to the side and spotted another body, also waist-deep in the ground. I kept my eyes forward, terrified that I would see more. 
As I was pulling my sister away from the body and back in the direction of the car, I heard footsteps. They were charging towards us, crunching on the rocks and the dirt. The sugar canes ahead of us bent out of the way. I heard the voice of a man screaming at us in a language I didn't understand. Suddenly, my sister snapped out of it. She grabbed my hand and we took off running through the field. We made it back to the car and sped down the road. We didn't say anything until we got back to the hotel. We contemplated getting the police involved, but neither of us knew where we were or even what we just saw. I know it seems wrong, but we just boarded a flight the next day and pretended the whole thing never happened. A few years ago, during my studies, I was tasked with researching and documenting serial killers from around the globe. That's when I heard about Ahmed Suraji, a cattle breeder from Indonesia that admitted to and was found guilty of killing around 40 girls. That by itself was enough to send shivers down my spine, but I kept reading and the next piece of information I read made my skin crawl. Ahmed Suraji admitted to killing women and burying their bodies waist deep in his sugarcane fields with their head facing his house as some part of a ritual to give him power. Even though I don't have any proof, I'm convinced that the man who was running at us in the sugarcane fields that day was Ahmed Suraji. Me and my sister came face to face with a serial killer, and we didn't even know it. Story number one. He stares. I was called by my son's school in the middle of the day. I was busy at work, so at first the fact that they were calling me made me very angry. I'm a single mother to a six-year-old boy. His father is around, but he's like Santa Claus that only shows up every other weekend and on holidays to spoil him rotten and then leave when he gets bored. I love my son, and he's usually an angel, so getting called by his school in the middle of the day was odd. At first, I was angry at my son. I was angry at the school. I'm at the point where my little angel can't do anything wrong, so my initial thought wasn't that he was in any sort of trouble. I leaned against the counter, hiding my face and pressing the phone to my ear as my manager shot dagger eyes in my direction. We weren't allowed to use our phones during the company's time, unless for emergencies. He didn't consider my son getting called to the principal's office an emergency. After a few minutes on hold, I finally got through to the principal. What he told me both confused the hell out of me and chilled me to the bone. The principal informed me that my son had been caught doodling in class during a test instead of doing his actual schoolwork. This was the part that confused me. I'd been caught doodling in class before. I'd been caught skipping class before. It usually isn't cause for a trip to the principal's office and a call to the parents. This was when I started getting angry. My son isn't the easiest child to deal with. He has anxiety and panic attacks often, and sometimes it doesn't even help that he's on so many different medications. I always thought the school made up issues with my son just because it was too difficult for them to deal with him and his attacks. My anger came out in my voice when I yelled at the principal for calling me at work over such a small matter. When he managed to get a word in, he managed to shut me up with just one word. He said the reason they were calling me wasn't because my son was caught doodling during a test. It was the nature of his drawing that concerned them. He said that my son's drawing was disturbing. Like I said, this kind of sent shivers down my spine. I could feel the manager's eyes burning a hole in the back of my skull and I knew he wouldn't let me off work early because of a disturbing drawing. I had to tell the school that I could only deal with the matter when I went to go pick him up at the end of the day. I wish I hadn't have left it like that. The word the principal used stuck with me for the rest of the day. How could a drawing be disturbing? I tried to imagine all different things it could be. I couldn't think of anything a six-year-old could draw that could be described with that word. Anyway, I finally clocked out of work and rushed to the school to pick up my son. They had kept him in the principal's office all day, and his teacher led me straight there. When I got there, my son was sitting at a table, happy and content, completely oblivious to anything that was going on around him. The principal didn't waste any time in handing me the drawing my son was caught making during the test. At first, the drawing seemed innocent enough. Then, I saw it. I didn't know what it was, but the sight of it made my legs weak and sent chills running all over my body. The longer I stared at the drawing, the more it disturbed me. I glanced at my son, happily drawing with the crayons and paper the teacher had given him. The things he was drawing were so colorful and happy, it was impossible to believe that he'd made the same one I was holding. 
My son usually refused to talk to anyone other than me and his dad, so the principal and his teachers couldn't get any answers out of him about the drawing. Once I composed myself, I sat down beside my son and asked him about it. He told me that the drawing was of him flying the kite when his dad took him to the park. I asked if the thing standing behind him was his dad, and he shook his head. He called it his friend. A lump formed in my throat, and I couldn't speak again until I'd swallowed it. I asked him questions about his friend, but he seemed reluctant to answer any of them. Then I asked him what his friend was doing. My son looked at me with the deepest and most honest look in his eyes, and he told me that his friend doesn't do anything. He just stares at him. I don't know what to do. I've been through all of his drawings, and I've been watching him like a hawk. I've instructed the school to watch him closely, but nothing has happened since that day. He hasn't made another drawing. Whenever I bring up his friend, he's always elusive, as if he doesn't want to talk about it or he's too scared to. I don't know who this friend of his is, and I'm not sure what scares me more, his empty black eyes staring down at my son, or the fact that he doesn't seem to have a mouth. Story number two, In the Window. My daughter loves drawing. She's just like her mother in that way. Her mother is an artist who sells her paintings at art galleries and on road shows. I am a happily married, stay-at-home dad. I love my girls and I love how they both share a love for art. My wife and I have tried our hardest to feed our daughter's desire to draw and paint. My wife says the only reason she is an artist today is because her father and mother encouraged her love of art. We want to do the same for our little girl. Now, she's only around eight years old now, so she's no Van Gogh. However, I do believe her talents are growing and her love for drawing is only getting stronger. She spends every free moment she has drawing something in her room. The moment she gets home from school, she'll run straight to her room and pull out the grands. I love watching her create her masterpiece just so she can show it to me and I can hang it up on the fridge. We're running out of room on our fridge. My wife's main form of income is her gallery but every so often she'll go on some road show where her and other artists travel around the country with pieces of art to sell them. Whenever she does this, my daughter and I are often left alone for about a month. It was a few days after my wife had left for one of her road shows. It was the weekend, and it was far too hot outside to do anything. All the fans were on, and I was enjoying a cold beer in front of the television. My daughter was doing what she usually does, drawing or painting in her bedroom. She came running downstairs suddenly, calling out for me. I sat up as she handed me her latest masterpiece. It was a drawing of her sleeping in her bed with the night sky shining through her window. I smiled. I'll admit that last beer had hit me kind of hard, so I didn't really give it a proper look. She asked me what I thought of the drawing, and I told her it was brilliant, as I usually did. I stood up and she followed me to the kitchen where I managed to find a space for her drawing on the fridge. She was always so happy to see another one of her drawings going up on the fridge. To her, it was similar to her mother's art gallery. I gave her a soda and she went outside to play for a bit. I sat and watched her from the shade of the porch. The walls around our garden are low and I've never really trusted the neighborhood we lived in. Whenever she went outside to play, either my wife or I would always watch her. Things can happen in a blink of an eye, and there are some dark people in the world. That same night, I tucked my daughter into bed and went into the kitchen to clean up the mess from dinner. I was exhausted, but at least the beer had cleared my system by then. I packed the leftovers into the fridge, and when I closed the door, something caught my eye. I already admitted to not paying too much attention to the drawing my daughter gave me that day. I leaned down and peered at it. There was something off about it that I didn't quite catch the first time I saw it. I stared at that drawing for what felt like the longest time. That's when I spotted it. The drawing seemed so innocent at first. It was just my daughter, sleeping in her bed, and the moon and stars shining in the night sky outside her window. There was something else in her window, something that I didn't see the first time. There were a pair of eyes on the outside of her window, staring in as my little girl slept in her bed. My heart pounded in my chest. All the blood rushed to my head. I felt sick. I felt like I was going to faint. At the same time, the blood in my veins boiled and my face felt hot with anger. I snapped out of it and rushed to my daughter's bedroom. 
I threw the door open, and she turned to look at me, confused and squinting at the light behind me. I glanced at her window. There was no one there. Still, that sick feeling inside of me grew. I grabbed her out of her bed and carried her into my bedroom on the second floor. She slept in my bed that night, and in the morning I made some calls. I called my wife, but she didn't know what we could do about it. I called the police, and they said there was nothing they could do about a little girl's drawing. When my wife got back home, we had a security system installed around the house with motion-sensing lights and cameras. We haven't caught anyone yet, but I still get sick to my stomach whenever I think about how someone was staring at my little girl through her bedroom window while she was asleep at night. Story number three, my big sister. Children are easily bored, and I don't blame them. I get bored if I don't have my phone, laptop, or at least a book in front of me. Music helps to cut through the boredom a little, but my body gets fidgety and my mind becomes restless if I don't have anything to do. I feel like, in some way, I relate to children a lot because of that. I guess that's why I got into babysitting. I mean, I needed the money as well. There's nothing quite like being a teenage girl with parents who won't buy you anything because they say you have to earn the things you get. So, I got into babysitting with a few kids around in my apartment block around three years ago. I actually enjoy it. I get to spend the day goofing around, and I get paid for it. There are a few bad things that have happened, like one kid falling off the couch when I wasn't looking and hitting his head on the coffee table. He was okay, but that experience stuck with me. I'm more vigilant now, maybe too vigilant. A new family moved into an apartment on my floor. They have a sweet little girl, and it wasn't long until some of the other parents recommended me to them as a babysitter. They were busy parents, so I ended up looking after their daughter a lot. She was sweet and quiet, so we got along well. She mostly sat on the floor in the living room with her crayons and coloring books. I got to sit with her and read or watch TV. I should stress that I don't know much about this family. They're kind of secretive. I don't know where they go when they leave me to babysit. I only know about their daughter, and even she keeps to herself. One day, the parents had knocked on my door suddenly and begged me to watch their daughter for a few minutes. I was busy doing homework, but they were so desperate that they offered to pay me double my rate. So, I agreed. I took my homework with me to their apartment and watched as the parents locked me in with their daughter. She was lying on her stomach on the living room floor, playing with her crayons. I shrugged it off as a family emergency or something and sat down next to her with my homework. We both worked quietly for a few minutes. Then, she suddenly looked up at me and asked if I wanted to see her drawing. I was stunned. My wide eyes and gaping mouth probably gave that away. In all the time I'd been looking after her, she never actually talked to me. When I said that she was quiet, I mean she was really quiet. Whenever I heard her talk, it was when she was asking her parents for something while I was around. This was the first time she'd talked directly to me. I smiled and nodded. She grabbed her piece of paper and crawled over to me on her knees. She sat down beside me and placed the drawing in my hand. So, I can't really explain what I was thinking when I looked at it. It was a child's drawing, after all. The drawing just showed a little girl standing on some grass on a sunny day. I figured the little girl was her. There was some kind of creature next to her, holding her hand. It had a big round body and long, sharp claws. It also looked like its mouth was filled with small, pointy teeth. It was hard to tell, but it still kind of freaked me out. She told me that she showed the drawing to her parents, but they didn't like it, which is why they left. That seemed strange to me, so I asked her about the drawing. I asked if it was a drawing of her and a pet or something. She said no. A chill ran up and down my spine at what she said. She told me that the girl in the drawing was her big sister, and the creature was the thing that killed her. I might have overreacted, but as soon as her parents got home, I walked out and told them I'd never babysit their daughter again. Like I said, children are easily bored, but if that was her way of having fun, then I wanted no part of it. That drawing freaked me out, and I would never be able to look at their daughter the same way again. What if she was telling the truth? Story number one, wrong number. In June 2004, an unsuspecting 911 operator received a very strange call. 
A young woman named Martha Stewart called 911 in the early hours of Saturday evening, where John, one of the operators working at the time, picked up the call. The call began with Martha trying to make an order for a pizza. Even after being told several times that she had called the wrong number, Martha continued to order her pizza as if she could not hear or understand John. John had been a 911 operator for over six years, and his training led him to believe that something else was going on. He then began asking Martha simple yes or no questions and was able to establish that she was being held against her will and asking for help. 911, where's your emergency? Hi, I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. Sorry ma'am, you've called the wrong number. Yes, I want an extra large with ham and pineapple. Ma'am, this is 911, you've called the wrong number. No extra cheese, but I'd like some extra sauce please. Ma'am, is there someone there with you? Yes. That's right. Are you able to tell me what is going on? No. Do you need me to send an officer to your home? Are you in danger? Yes, I am. Okay, ma'am. What is your address? I've dispatched a car to your location, and they should be there in a few minutes. Are you able to stay on the line with me? I'm not sure. Can you tell me what your name is? Martha Stewart. Okay, Martha. An officer will be there as soon as possible. Stay on the line with me as long as you can. Can you tell me how many people are there with you? Just one. Is this someone that you know holding you against your will? Yes. The officers are only a block away now, Martha. You're doing great. Just stay on the line with me. I'll be paying cash on delivery for the pizza. Is it still safe for us to talk, Martha? I don't know. I want you to stay on the line with me as long as you can. But if you feel like you're in danger, then hang up the phone and wait for the officers to get there. Okay. Is there anyone else in the house with you, or are you expecting anyone to come home? Thank you. I'll see you soon. Martha hung up the call shortly after that. She had to wait a further five minutes for the officers that were dispatched to her area. The officers were advised to keep their sirens off and did not announce themselves before knocking on the door, and Martha was able to let them into the home. Before this incident, Martha Stewart had recently ended an abusive relationship with a very violent ex-boyfriend, George Marcus. She said that he was an alcoholic and would beat her on a constant basis. With the help of her family, she was able to end the relationship. George arrived at her door on the night of the call in a drunken state. Martha had unlocked the door with the intention of telling George to leave or she'd call the police. Before she got the chance to, George kicked the door down and forced his way into the house. Martha said she received a beating from George before he sat himself down on the couch as if they'd never broken up. He ordered her to make him something for dinner, which is when she got the idea to call and order a pizza instead. George watched Martha closely as she dialed 911 and pretended to be ordering a pizza for him. John, who'd received years of experience, realized that something was wrong and began to ask her the right questions in order to understand the situation. Officers were dispatched and arrived at Martha's house shortly after she was forced to end the call. An ambulance was called on site to treat her, but Martha's injuries were only minor bruises and cuts. Her ex-boyfriend was taken into custody and Martha received a police escort to her parents' house nearby. If it weren't for Martha's quick thinking and John's years of training, Martha might not have gotten the help she needed that night. Story number two, there's a man in the house. The names and locations in this story have been kept anonymous. On the last day of October in 2002, the streets were filled with young trick-or-treaters going from house to house in a small neighborhood. It was just past 11 p.m. when a 911 operator received a disturbing call from a 10-year-old girl. The 10-year-old girl had just gotten back home from a night of trick-or-treating with her younger brother and her mother. Shortly after they got home, an intruder broke into their house through the back door, which had been left unlocked at the time. The 10-year-old girl thought quickly and hid herself underneath the bed in her and her brother's bedroom and called 911 for help while the intruder made his way through their home. 911 operator, where's your emergency? There's a man in the house. There's a man in the house? Yes, there's a man inside the house. Okay, and what's your address? We live at... Okay, and is there anyone else in the house with you? My brother and my mom, but I think he has them because they were downstairs and I heard him yelling. Are you saying the intruder has your mother and your brother? Yes, they were downstairs. 
And where are you? I'm hiding underneath my bed. Are you downstairs? No, I'm upstairs. I'm in my bedroom. I'm underneath the bed. Okay, how old are you? I'm 10 years old, but I'm turning 11 next month. You're 10 years old? That's good. You're doing so good. I need you to stay on the phone with me. I'm trying to get an officer over to you right now. Just stay on the phone with me. Okay. I think I need to whisper because I think he can hear me. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to speak at all if you think he can hear you. Just stay on the line with me. The officers are on their way. I think he's coming upstairs. Just stay where you are and stay quiet, okay? The officers are on their way now. Are you able to lock your bedroom door? Don't speak, just say yes or no if you can. No. Okay, sweetie. Just stay underneath the bed and don't speak if you think he can hear you. He's going back down the stairs now because my brother started crying. He's back downstairs? Yes. My brother is crying and he's yelling at them. The officers are on their way. We have a lot of officers in your area and they're heading to you now. Is there anyone else in the house beside you? Your mother and your brother? No. And is it just the one intruder? I think so. Can you tell me what he looks like? I don't want you to go try and see him. Just tell me if you know what he looks like. No. I didn't see him. I was upstairs when I heard him come in through the back door. I hid under the bed. I didn't see him. That's okay. The officers are there now. They're here. Yes, they're coming to the front door now. Thanks to the quick thinking and bravery of a 10-year-old girl, the intruder that broke into their home on the night of October 31st was apprehended and no one was injured. The mother of a young 10-year-old girl and an 8-year-old boy arrived home past 11 p.m. after a long night of trick-or-treating. Her 10-year-old daughter had gone upstairs to get ready for bed just as a man broke into their house through the unlocked back door. The mother and her 8-year-old son were being held captive downstairs, while the 10-year-old daughter hid underneath her bed upstairs and called 911. The 911 operator stayed on the line with the 10-year-old girl and tried to get as much information as possible in order to send help her way. The operator stated after the incident that she could hear the fear in the little girl's shaky voice, but she stayed brave throughout the whole thing and gave the operator all the information she needed to send the officers. When officers arrived at the scene, they were able to kick down the front door and the intruder surrendered. He had not injured anyone and did not have time to steal anything from the home. He was arrested and the family of three learned that it is better to always keep their back door locked. Story number three, a long fall. In the year 2012, a man who will remain anonymous went on a long hike, which he had done many times before. The man had hiked down the same trail several times and nothing bad had ever happened. One day in the middle of July, the man went down the same trail again. The week before that day had been riddled with thunderstorms and floods. The trail he hiked down was muddy and unstable, but the man was confident in his hiking skills. He started his hike early in the day and around late afternoon a 911 operator received a call from the man. What is your emergency? Uh, I'm not sure. I think I might have hit my head. I can't think of the name of the trail right now. You think you've hit your head? Yes. I know what trail I'm on, but I can't think of the name right now. My head is throbbing. All right, I do have your coordinates. I need you to stay on the line with me. I've sent a search and rescue to you right now. Can you tell me what happened? I was hiking and I fell. There was a cliff. I think the ground gave way. You've fallen off a cliff? Yes. There was a lot of mud, and I fell. I think I'm at the bottom of a cliff now. Do you know how far you fell? I, I'm not sure. I, I can't see anything. It's dark. I can't see. It's dark and you can't see. Is there something on top of you? Yeah. Yeah, I think there is. I think it's mud or something. I, I can't move. Don't try and move. The search and rescue are on their way. They have your coordinates and they're searching the area. Okay. Are you alone? Is there someone there with you? No. I'm alone. No one knows I'm out here. All right. I hike this trail all the time. That's okay. I need you to tell me if you're injured or not. 
I'm not sure. I, th I think I hit my head and I can't really move or feel anything. All right. Search and rescue are nearby at your location. Just hold on and stay on the line while you wait for them, okay? Okay. While hiking down a trail that he's hiked down several times before, the man stood at the edge of a cliff admiring the view at the end of the trail. He didn't realize that the rain and flooding over the week had severely weakened the cliff's structure. The ground beneath him gave way, and the man fell nearly 50 meters to the bottom. The man was unsure if he lost consciousness, but was able to reach for his phone and call 911 for help. The 911 operator was able to get some information out of the man, but his head injuries made it difficult for them to find his location. They were able to determine his coordinates from the phone call, and search and rescue was sent to the area straight away. The man was unsure if he was injured, and was unable to move due to debris and mud from the cliff edge being stacked on top of him. The man stayed surprisingly calm during the ordeal. After the incident, the man said he didn't even think he was in immediate danger because he couldn't feel any pain, and the only reason he called 911 was because he couldn't move. The caller's phone lost signal, and the call to 911 was abruptly ended. The search and rescue found him soon after that, and he was airlifted to safety. The man was sent to the hospital with a spinal injury that caused temporary paralysis in his lower body. The man said he was thankful for the injury because otherwise he might have been in extreme pain during the ordeal and he might not have been able to react the way he did and call for help.